Um, yeah, welcome to the first session this morning. Uh, and what I would like to talk about is Apache Flink on uh, Apache Mesos. So maybe just a quick raise of hands. How many of you have used Flink before? How many of you have used Flink on Mesos? One, okay. Let's maybe change that a bit. Um, so why I'm actually really excited about this project is because it's a really, uh, it's one of those showcases of community work coming together. So this Apache Flink scheduler, which is being written, that's a collaboration of people from uh, Lightband, uh, EMC, uh, Data Artisans, and us uh, Mesosphere. And there are actually also always uh, other like individual community contributions. So this is why I especially like this project quite a lot, because it's actually a lot of people coming together, developing really cool, uh, software, really cool integrations of two open source projects. Um, this talk, um, Till, he's working with Data Artisans and he is actually right now, they're having a release uh, which we'll see in the end, which has some pretty cool new features, even giving us more power when running on Mesos, giving us more elasticity. And this is why he unfortunately couldn't make it here to uh, MesosCon, but uh, he's still, he's like part of this uh, presentation in heart. If we look back at computing, if we look back like 10, maybe even like 15 years, uh, time flies, it was pretty simple. We had like one option if we were open source, if we weren't Google or Facebook, and this was like build a huge Hadoop map reduce cluster and crunch your data. So that kind of worked. We didn't have much other choices, and that was basically our one big cluster. Nowadays, it's unfortunately, it's a little more complex and we need to turn faster. We have realized that MapReduce isn't really efficient, isn't really fast in uh, latency uh, when it comes down to latency. So we actually, we need something faster here. What m do we actually mean by faster? And uh, so what we often see is that people implement something which is called the smack stack. So uh, the smack stack, this is basically this typical iteration if I want to implement something which needs to be faster. Like on the left side, I now have events where if we look back to MapReduce, it often were like large chunks of batch data we were collecting over either the entire month, over the week. But now when we're talking about fast data, we are more talking about events. And events, that could be, for example, a credit card transaction, that can be a plane, that can be any kind of infrastructure which has sensors attached, self-driving cars probably come to mind, Uber and all those technologies which are actually collecting a lot of data in real time. And with such kind of system, the infrastructure becomes a little more complex. So all of a sudden, I can't simply write it all to a big file and then digest it at one point because I want to do that in real time. So what I'll usually do instead is I'll write it into an ingestion queue, uh, which could be, for example, Apache Kafka. And then I actually have my analytics layer, which could be Spark, which could be Flink, um, or any tool I actually want here. And the results I then usually store somewhere uh, in some distributed data store. And storing, of course, it's not sufficient by itself. I actually have to act up on this as well. So usually I also, in such kind of infrastructure for processing fast data, I also uh, have like an uh, actor which often is implemented in Acker because it's really nice. But there are also many different other implementations. And with this stack, we actually, we are fulfilling like one part of this picture, which would be the event processing part. But if we look at the overall uh, picture of our overall data analytics needs, it's not just the smack stack, it's, or it's not just this fast uh, event processing data. It's actually, it's more. We still have use cases for batch data, for example, where cases where I don't really care about latency, where I can collect all my data and then I run it at the end of the months uh, with like best effort on my infrastructure, basically just maxing out whatever compute resources I've left from my other services. Then for many other services, uh, so for example, if I'm Amazon, I want to uh, show you new product recommendations, I want to update my real-time pricing, uh, depending on what users are willing to pay or how many users there are. Uh, I actually, I want something faster because then I cannot wait for days or hours to actually update that. But minutes and maybe like tens of seconds is actually okay. 
So that's then where we usually talk about micro batches. Uh, and then this last uh, use case where I actually need response times immediately. So if I'm using my credit card here in Prague, I don't want to wait for 10 or 20 seconds until the bank authorizes this and says, yeah, this is an okay transaction. I want an answer as quickly as possible. So uh, as we've seen, there are use cases for actually many of those in our infrastructure. So it's not just reducing to one of them. We actually, we need all of this for some kind of uh, scenarios or in most scenarios. And for me, the Smack Stack, um, so coming back to this pac picture, Smack Stack actually, uh, as you might have guessed, uh, is uh, comes from these individual names. So uh, the S actually stands for Spark. The uh, M actually stands for Apache Missiles, as we hear at MissilesCon. The A stands for Akka, C stands for Cassandra, and K uh, is representing Kafka in our case. And for me, if I'm talking about the Smack Stack, it's not so much about those individual technologies uh, making up the name, because actually in each of those layers, we have a different number of options to implement them differently. And uh, here, I actually would like to take a look at the analytics layer, what kind of options we have here. So if we look at stream processing, even though the Smack Stack is named after the first letter comes from Spark, there are actually many other options. So uh, the first one probably around there being used was Apache Storm. Then Spark is very common, uh, still probably the most favorite tool set to be used here. Uh, but we also have other tools as SAMHSA, Flink, or Apex uh, becoming really popular right now. I was really happy to see the Apex stickers uh, at the booth over at the Apache booth, for example. And then if we also take a look at those different cloud providers we are having, um, most of them are actually offering their own solutions like Kinesis, uh, Dataflow. So all of a sudden, I actually have a lot of choice uh, to choose from. So if we take a look at Spark, and as I said, Spark is probably still the most commonly used one. And that's probably for this reason, because it's not just for stream processing. A lot of people have already implemented jobs in Spark, for example, for their batch processing. They already have a setup infrastructure, which they might use for any of those use cases up there. So machine learning, graph processing, uh, even like Spark SQL. So there's actually an entire ecosystem around Spark. And Spark streaming is just one part, which nicely fits into this picture. Um, if we look at Spark streaming, or actually, uh, as I was just at Spark Summit, uh, we are mostly talking about Spark streaming 2.0 nowadays. So uh, what's kind of the implementation detail, which is also important if you consider whether it's suitable for you or not, is actually the way in which Spark is dealing with that. Spark has been originally been written as this batch processor, and they actually utilize the same code paths and the same structure for uh, their streaming jobs. And how they do that is they actually collect individual um, tuples. So they might, for example, collect five tuples. And then they will actually go and process this micro batch, uh, similar as they would do with a large batch of data. So they actually uh, can reuse the same jobs and the same code to do so. That is very nice because, first of all, it's efficient. Secondly, uh, yeah, it's really cool for me because I don't necessarily have to write new code. Uh, but on the other hand, it adds some latency because all of a sudden I have to wait for this micro batch to fill up. So if I actually have to choose uh, between Spark and maybe some of those other implementations, some th things I should consider is, for example, the execution model, whether I have the need, the latency need for something native streaming, which would pr uh, process each tuple individually, or whether I'm actually okay with micro batches. Um, I should consider which fault tolerance guarantees I need, how quickly I should recover from failures. So for example, if I'm running on a lot of spot instances and I really expect many of them to fail slash be shut down uh, during the runtime of a job. Maybe I should also consider like how long does it take to recover from a failed job. And um, if we look at this execution model, and this is basically what we've been talking about, this main distinction is that Spark is collecting those micro batches of data. And then on the other side, most of the other frameworks, they're actually processing each tuple individually. This is not necessarily just p 
purely better. So this is just different because it also adds some overhead such as accounting, uh, such as processing. If I can just process one batch at a time, this of course is being more efficient than if I have to have the yeah, accounting overhead for each individual tuple. And this is actually this, this is true also for the fault tolerance guarantees. And as we can see, Flink is actually kind of cheating or trying to be uh, more efficient there as well. <coughs> as actually keeping track of each tuple for fault tolerance, so basically saying checkpoint, this tuple has been pr uh, processed. Uh, and if there is a failure, I don't have to reprocess it. Um, it actually um, doesn't want to do that per each individual tuple. So what Flink does is the acknowledgement um, per uh, per batch. And I think I uh, this should be in the uh, uh, other order. Sorry for that. So um, what Storm does, Storm actually does uh, actually acknowledge each individual record. And what Flink is doing is a checkpoint per batch. So they go in. Uh, they process each tuple individually, but then the checkpoint they are making is actually per batch of data or per micro batch of data. And obviously, uh, Spark, as they are processing micro batches anyhow, is doing the same for fault tolerance. Uh, delivery guarantees, and somehow on this beamer, I think my uh, head headings get messed up. Uh, so, uh, what Storm is providing or uh, claims to provide is, for example, exactly one semantics. So, they are saying, I'm really just going to process uh, each of them uh, at least once. What um, many other frameworks write on, on the outside is that they support this exactly once guarantees. But you should be careful what's being meant by that because we're talking about distributed systems. And actually, uh, in distributed systems, it's uh, never, you can never guarantee to process each tuple just once because there's always like one point of failure, one failure mode where this might fail because it fails at exactly the instruction where you would checkpoint something. So uh, you should be careful when writing your applications uh, whether you're actually going to receive or process uh, tuples uh, multiple times or whether you expect them to uh, be just processed once. So for example, a typical pattern is to inclu include some key in your data and once you've processed that key, you actually wouldn't process it again. What does it mean for our data center? Uh, it means for our data center, those times where, we, where Hadoop would own the entire cluster, they are basically over. And uh, so nowadays, we actually talk a lot about different subpartitions in our cluster. We might have a Flink subpartition, we might have a, f a Kafka subpartition, we might have a microservice subpartition, like 10, 20 nodes for our microservices. And this is usually very annoying because first of all, it adds operator overhead. And secondly, the uh, utilization is really going down because I'm wasting resources in each of those subclusters. And as we're at MesosCon, this is exactly the vision of Mesos to basically unify those, all those resources into like one big pool. And I'm actually treating them as like one big resource. And hence, I don't care on which node, for example, Flink is being scheduled. I simply say, I expect Flink to have, I don't know, 20 CPUs uh, worth of computing time. Still, if I'm just looking at pure missiles, there are still challenges. So uh, if you've seen uh, IREX uh, DCS uh, talk, actually missiles is just a kernel and we have need for stuff around. So for example, scheduling, monitoring, security, CLI. Uh, companies as Critio, as Apple, as Netflix, they all have large teams around it, which can actually build that themselves. But um, in general, we don't want to build all this themselves. We just want to install our operating system and be able to roll. And this is the vision of the open source DCOS, uh, where I basically can install all of that out of the box. I don't want to go in more detail on DCOS because I think we heard a lot about it this morning. Still, developing all those services, developing um, a Spark service on DCOS, developing a Kafka service, developing a ca uh, Cassandra service is really hard. So for example, here, this is a state diagram for the persistence in one of those frameworks. So you can see you don't necessarily have to understand it in detail, but you can see it has some complexity of really ensuring that you have just reserved persistent volumes in a meaningful fashion. Um, and there are other uh, 
challenges such as how do I support multiple frameworks, how do I support upgrades between frameworks, and so on. And this is exactly uh, where we need to operate those distributed services or develop them. And this is where the SDK, which was also already mentioned this morning, comes in, um, where I actually can simply write a YAML file and potentially extend it with custom strategies. Uh, so I don't actually have to write the scheduler from scratch with all the complexities, uh, such as uh, reserving persistent volumes, but I can actually just uh, install that out of the box. And this is actually what we are currently working on for Flink as well. Flink currently is one of those schedulers uh, which is down here, build your own scheduler. Uh, but we actually uh, are progressing rather quickly in both bringing that scheduler forward and also moving uh, towards the SDK. So right now our focus is actually to implement new Flink features. So we'll talk about this uh, really cool Jira, which is called Flip6 in just a second, which actually adds a lot of elasticity. So that will currently still be implemented in the uh, original scheduler, which lives in the Flink code. But in the future, we actually uh, are planning to move to the SDK. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, why is that actually a good match? So what do we need if we are Flink? So we actually we need to be able to run multiple applications, multiple jobs. We need to have dynamic resource allocation in a large cluster. And we, most important, we actually we need to be available. If our stream, streaming jobs are running and there's a node failing, I still want that the job is up and running because it should actually process all the events coming in. Why does Apache Mesos help me there? Because actually Mesos is exactly written for this goal to uh, implement fault-tolerant and elastic distributed applications. And as an interesting fact, um, together with the Flink community, we had a survey of how people are using Flink. And 30% of the survey respondents said they were running Flink on Mesos even before we introduced the official support into before we introduced this uh, official Mesos framework. So they were running it in Marathon or some kind of other setup simply to have this fault tolerance. And so that was kind of the cue for us to actually write a proper Mesos uh, integration of in, in the Flink code base. And it's kind of, it's a traditional scheduler if you want so to say. So the scheduler part, this is there on the left uh, where we have uh, the resource manager, which is talking to the Mesos master, and then the job manager, which is basically responsible for spawning up all the tasks. So kind of this uh, two responsibilities of a framework, first of all, resource management, and secondly, those task management uh, has been divided into those two components. And if we look at a little deeper into the uh, resource manager, it actually has uh, four components. First of all, it's simply the connection manager, which is checking, hey, can I still talk to the Mesos master? Or do I actually need, is there a new leader election? Has there been a failure in the Mesos master? Um, then there is uh, the task monitor, which is monitoring the task, and uh, the launch coordinator, which is actually responsible for launching them. And the interesting part for the launch co coordinator is that we choose to write it in Fenso. How many of you actually know Fenso? Yeah, many actually. So it's it's a library which allows me, uh, which allows me to easily write schedulers, and in particular, uh, it allows me to easily write offer matching logic. So often, if I'm implementing my own scheduler, I have to write things like uh, I have to or. Actually, constantly, I have to decide whether I want to accept an offer or not. And this should be based on certain criteria. Do I have enough resources? Is this co-located with other stuff? Uh, and so basically, what uh, most scheduler implementations do, they'll collect some uh, offers, and then they'll decide, should I keep them or reject them? How many of them should I actually accept? And Fenso is a really easy tool to make that very simple to implement, so you don't have to implement all that logic from scratch. The reconciliation uh, coordinator is uh, responsible for if there has been a failure, if there's been a master switch, if the framework is uh, restarted somewhere else because the scheduler failed for some reason. Uh, it actually, we always need to reconcile the state between the master and the scheduler. So if you want uh, that both have the same view on the cluster again, and this is what the reconciliation coordinator is for. Um, 
So the engine play is basically here. Those uh, the missus master is going to send out uh, offers, and the launch coordinator will then decide whether it should start something. The launch coordinator uh, will then receive a startable task uh, from uh, either the reconciliation uh, coordinator, um, and uh, then it will basically launch them. Uh, once it has launched them, the task monitor is responsible for actually monitoring them. So that's the component which will process the uh, stat task status updates it's going to receive from the master. And if something is failing, uh, the reconciliation coordinator will uh, coordinate with the master to uh, yeah, restart all those new tasks, to recover those tasks. As mentioned, this Fenzo library, if you ever go to implement your own scheduler without the SDK, I can just highly recommend taking a look here. So it's kind of <coughs> really helpful uh, because it has this pluggable fitness evaluator, which, as mentioned, helps you to decide whether you want to accept an offer or whether you don't want to accept an offer. And this is just integrated into the launch coordinator here. So the launch coordinator basically receives the task it wants to launch with uh, their task description, and then Fanso can automatically match them to, uh, to the matching resource offers, so, uh, and then kind of return which ones should be started. And now this is actually my probably my favorite slide. Uh, this is the new architecture which will be in the next Flink version. And this is what I previously described as Flip 6. And we're actually restructuring a lot of the code around. So first of all, we're going to have a proper Mesos dispatcher. And this actually helps if we want to spin up multiple of those. The way you would currently start Flink is basically you spin up here this component here. But now you actually have this long-running dispatcher. And for any job you, would, you can start, you would spin up one of those new uh, resource manager, job manager uh, process bundles. So it makes it much easier to actually uh, run multiple jobs on Flink. The other big advantage uh, we are having, which maybe it's not quite apparent on the slide, but as we restructured this code, we actually made it uh, flexible uh, the resources you can allocate to running job. Imagine you have a long running um, Flink job. In the beginning, you might actually might want to use some more resources, but uh, then at the end, or maybe at night, you actually don't have that many users, you don't have that many events coming in. So now you can actually scale it down and then scale it up again while the job is running. So you can basically spin up those task managers uh, more dynamically during the runtime of a job, which previously was only possible uh, when you started up uh, your system. So this really gives us a lot of flexibility and better resource utilization when running large, long-running Flink jobs on top of Mesos. All right, uh, let's flip over here. Because how much time do I have left? Really? Okay. Awesome. So this gives us enough time to actually go through the demo. And the demo is something uh, where I simply want to uh, show one of those Smack-like uh, pipelines uh, together with Flink here. So on the left, we have our data generator, which is basically just putting out financial transactions. So our goal with this demo is that we actually want to detect fraud. Uh, fraud in this meaning uh, of money laundering. So uh, a transaction is basically I'm transferring money from account A to account B. And whenever this over multiple transactions sums up to more than 10,000 US dollars, there's potential money laundering. And then something, someone should be alerted. And so how this demo is set up, and as mentioned, this is kind, kind of the typical smack stack setup. So this is on uh, the left, uh, our data generator. It will write all those transaction data, A to B, this amount. It will write that into Kafka. And then I can have, I have multiple options. I can either run Spark, I can run Flink, and uh, those would be consuming the data out of Kafka and trying to aggregate it over 
certain time windows and trying to detect whether the amount of transactions in this time window is greater than 10,000 uh, US dollars. We'll see that in code in just a second. But what I really like about it, and this is kind of one of the advantages of using Kafka and such kind of smack stack uh, architecture, is that actually here in the middle, I have a lot of flexibility uh, in what I want to do. I can actually run Spark and Flink simultaneously processing the same data from the Kafka queue. And this is because Kafka actually is also persisting data. And uh, so I can have multiple consumers consuming the same data. And this feature of Kafka that it's actually also persisting data, we make use of that in the fourth step as well, where we actually use Kafka as the data store. Um, and so the results out of this Flink job, they're actually written back into Kafka. Um, as kind of the persistence layer in our smack stack. And then we have a short little display which will actually show that in the end. So let me... F oh, and people are already clapping over there. <laughs> Do I really have half an hour left? Okay. I'll try to type quickly. So if you haven't seen DCOS, it kind of comes uh, with, this, uh, with this app store. This app store makes it really easy to install things. And first of all, I actually, I need to install Cassandra because, uh, no, I don't, uh, I'm talking wrong, uh, wrong, wrong demo. Uh, first thing I, I should install is Flink. So let me install Flink here, great. And the second thing we actually need, uh, recalling my slide <laughs> and recalling the right demo, is uh, I need Kafka. So let's also install Kafka. And I want the normal Kafka, not the Confluent version. Great. So if we look at our services, we see that both Flink and Kafka are uh, deploying. And um, while they, they're doing that, we can actually already go in and uh, distribute our data generator. Uh, so here I'm, and actually this demo is online, so anyone who wants to run that, uh, feel free to do so. And just to have a look at it, uh, the generator, it's a really easy, easy JSON file. And all it does is basically curl this uh, image, uh, curl the binary, and then run it. And in my opinion, this is something really nice about uh, DCOS and Mesos, uh, therefore, that I don't have to construct a full container image. So usually I would expect that I have packaged that into a Docker container. I pull that Docker container, I run that Docker container. Here I can actually just uh, run that as is and kind of construct the container on the fly. So let's deploy that DCOS Marathon app at generator.json, and this is deploying, so we hopefully see that here in a second. Yes, here it's coming up, and it's already running, because actually I don't have to pull like large images, I simply need to pull like this, I think it's like two megabyte binary, and uh, it's actually up and running. So if we take a look here into the logs, it's hopefully already producing, yes, it's already producing, uh, transactions. Kafka is also already up and running. So the next thing I need to do is I need to create those pipes in Kafka. So I can do that from the CLI as well. DCS Kafka topic, I guess it's just topic, create fraud. Let me create the first one, which would be the output. Ah. DCS as I installed Kafka from the UI, I don't have the CLI extension installed. So let me quickly do that. Package install Kafka. Yes, I want the CLI extension. And now I hopefully can create my topic. That's looking good because it's taking long, great. And now let me also create a trans 
actions topic. Transaction. Ah, it, it already exists because my generator is already up and running. As the generator is actually writing into transactions, the generator was faster in bringing it, it up. So once we automatically write data into a non-existent topic, it's automatically created. So good, we have both our topics here. Great. Um, so uh, let's look at Flink here. And Flink comes with the usual uh, web UI you might be used to. Uh, by the way, I can do the same from the CLI. So similar as Kafka, Flink also has a CLI. But I usually, I, I like the squirrel just so much. So uh, I usually go right here. Too many folders. It's in my Go directory because there's some Go code in there. Almost there. Okay, Flink job. And now I'm simply going to upload the jar. Upload. And if we care about the code, I don't think we have time, so, or? Now, we'll, we'll skip the code. The code is online. So what I like about the Flink code, and this is actually why I choose Flink to do this demo, is simply because uh, it has a very nice way of dealing with event time. So if we're, dealing, if we're doing stream processing, we have multiple options to deal with time. I can either, so if I'm doing a window, for example, over a day, so if I'm saying within a day, I don't want to see any uh, transactions summing up to more than $10,000, and then the question is what notion of time we're talking about. Is it the notion at which the event arrives at the stream processor? Is it, or is it actually the time at which the event was created? And Flink has very nice support for this event time. So actually the data generator is adding the timestamp at which time the event is created. And uh, Flink makes it really easy to utilize uh, that event time and sum up over event time or have the window size over event time. Let me just start the job. Cool. We see it's up and running. And now this is basically this uh, streaming job which could run forever, which could f run forever in the background. So for example, also when you would upgrade your Flink job, uh, your Flink version, you can keep the job up and running. Uh, which is kind of necessary if you actually want like high availability and you don't want to impact your users simply because you're upgrading your system. Cool, and we see that uh, everything is running now, that's great. And the last thing uh, we actually need is our, uh, our monitoring tool. And this is actually also here in the repo. I said the link is also on the slides, so this is our actor. And Simply going to deploy that. Again, this is a simple Go binary, so it should be up rather quickly. It's deploying, pulling the binary, and now it's up and running. And now all we can do here, we already have the first detected fraud. So what this system will do, uh, it will show us uh, from which time stamp to which timestamp. We have detected transactions summing up to more than $10,000. And this is like one transaction over $3,300 and one over $8,000. So it sums up to more. And if we keep that running, it's probably going to detect more over time. So as it goes on, it detects more and more uh, fraud over time. So this is as easy as it is to set up such kind of pipeline uh, in an orchestrated fashion. We see that our cluster utilization is going up. And this is probably one of those metrics I should monitor uh, how good my cluster utilization is, which actually brings me to my next slide, uh, which uh, would be about how to, how to keep this actually up and running. So if I go here, usually when giving a demo, 
I really like this demo effect. It's up and running in the end. But if you're an operator or even a developer developing such kind of pipeline, you should remember that the hard part actually comes afterwards. How do I keep that up and running? How can I update my Kafka? How can I update my Spark? How can I update my Flink while keeping this pipeline up and running and being available for the users? Because if I'm using my credit card and that wouldn't detect like money laundering fraud, but it would see whether my credit card transaction is okay, then I actually don't want to wait uh, for the system to be upgraded until I can use my credit card. This should be up and running all the time. So, uh, conclusion, uh, Flink uh, is a has really nice integration with Mesos, uh, and it's, as said, it's going to be even nicer in the next Flink release, which should be out next month, uh, because we actually support dynamic resource allocation during a running job. And this actually, together with uh, DCS and the other packages which are available on DCS, it's a really easy way uh, of building first of all of running Fling, and secondly of building an entire pipeline which usually is needed to run Flink in an efficient way uh, in a streaming architecture. Thank you very much for listening. Um, as said, uh, Till, he was also quite involved in here, but uh, he's finishing uh, the next uh, Flink release, so we have even cooler things to showcase uh, next time around. Any questions? Uh, I, I believe you were first or behind you. Where, uh, where are we going here? Yeah. Thanks. Um, a question about the upgrades, so deployments, a new Flink versions of new jobs versions. If we fix something in the job, does oh. it use the save points? Uh, what, how does it work to so minimize that downtime? To, to minimize that downtime, you should configure Flink uh, together with a stable store, usually HDFS, and then it's uh, checkpointing those uh, yeah, checkpoints on the stable storage. And when upgrading, uh, this will also be easier with the next version. Uh, you basically, you, uh, the new you kill one uh, worker, it's spin up the new version worker, uh, that picks up a checkpoint, and so on and so on, and then you just cycle through. Can I spin up the new version while the old version running and then kind of do the, the you switch there? You, you, you can do the same. So this what I described first would kind of be a rolling upgrade. The second yeah. thing would kind of be a blue-green deployment style of upgrade. Okay, thanks. And uh, oh, by the way, if you're interested in or exactly have such kind of questions, uh, there's in the DCOS Slack uh, channel, which is DCOS, uh, which is chat.dcosio, there's a Flink channel where exactly those things are being discussed. Uh, thank, you for <coughs> thank you for the talk. Uh, I have uh, one question. If I, maybe it's for my lack of knowledge of Flink, mm -hmm. but uh, do, you <coughs> do you talk about dynamic uh, resource uh, allocation? But how can Flink manage in a state? Uh, a stateful situation like uh, uh, I always think like a Spark when Spark use a update state by key, and you have to to have this uh, resource allocation. You have to base your your program in external services. Is the same for Flink or has another architecture? The, the architecture is slightly different. I yesterday had a really interesting discussion about exactly this architectural difference at Spark Summit. Um, <laughs> key. TL, TLDR is that uh, Flink is keeping track of the state differently. So if you spin up a new worker in the new version, right? I'm talking about the unreleased version right now. It will basically spin up a new worker and then uh, using uh, similar to dynamic hashing techniques, uh, we basically uh, redistribute the new incoming queries and it can automatically gather as said, the checkpoints are written to HDFS or some kind of stable storage in the cluster, so the new worker can also retrieve that stable storage. That is the TLDR. Uh, I'm happy to share the design docs for that uh, if you're caring about more detail on that. If I understand well, I think that you say that uh, the framework is moving to the commons in the future. Is yeah, right? not for the next release, 
but there are plans to move it. Um, it ki kind of depends, but we are actively discussing it. Let's just put it this way. Uh, there are uh, meetings, as said, if you're interested in also inputting your opinions there. So it's a lot of discussions of uh, pure Mesos support, where there's DCOS support. So kind of balancing. It's just uh, the discussion point we're seeing is that uh, some people running it on DCOS, they would benefit by having uh, better security uh, integration. So right now you can set it up, but it's pretty difficult. Uh, you have to set a lot of parameters. And if it's basically generated by the uh, DCOS SDK, you kind of get that all very simple in a very simple setup way. What most likely will happen is that at the beginning, we're going to maintain two kind of versions uh, until, uh, first of all, the DCOS SDK is either it's runnable on Mesos, uh, so it kind of has an output. Let's see whether that happens. Uh, or um, kind of uh, we have all features completed. So we'll always, let's just say, we'll always support the Mesos users as well, which are not running on DCOS. This is like an important part of our discussion. Uh, also about the commons, the, the actual intent is more related to, to to store a framework than processing one, I suppose. And oh, yeah. you, you, you mean like this, uh, for example, the dispatcher architecture? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right now, uh, this is also why, this is the second reason why we're still waiting, uh, is uh, the uh, SDK support. But this is in general, we also found some ways to hack around that for uh, for the TensorFlow framework, uh, and uh, this is the same problem there. So we could find out, f figure out a way how to do that. Uh, it's just once the SDK probably supports that, this kind of dispatcher architecture, which you also have in Spark, which you have in many other frameworks, then it's going to be much nicer. Right. And, the, and the last question is about yeah. Fenso. How do you decide to include Fenso at the core of the of this uh, scheduler versus, I support implementing that kind of logic, uh, a custom logic for doing that kind we, of? Uh, we first of all we looked at the logic in Spark. Then we looked at um, so the history of how we got the scheduler being written was the initial support in Flink only Yarn, and then we moved over so we kind of refactored the Flink code and moved over, uh, moved it to a more general architecture so we can support both Yarn and Mesos. Um, and uh, in that, we figured out that we actually, we have to do a lot of code of matching, which you know that Yarn has kind of a different model uh, where it request. Um, when writing that, it was kind of holding us up and there actually, Fenso was really helpful in writing it because it took away all this logic we would otherwise have to write and maintain into a very simple component. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.